Good evening, everybody. This is the College of Complex. And we have a speaker with us tonight, Rob Bendick. Uh, he has been here before. And uh, he will be speaking on how to rescue the future. Uh, and he has a plan for it called the North American Water and Power Alliance. Uh, the acronym for which is NOAPA, uh, and it's, uh, he thinks, the only project big enough, wide enough, and uh, ready to begin to build a future after the collapse of world war we seem to be headed for. Uh, he advocates the use of a constitutional amendment uh, to remove our president uh, for moral and uh, mental incompetence. Uh, the reinstatement of the uh, last Beal Act. Coming over here, I was trying to think of a way to start, what kind of subject might kick this off, and I got solicited on the radio uh, to invest in euros, the euro, which um, is going under in a hyperinflationary blowout, but yet you have the mouthpieces continue to um, push various versions of the monetary system. So we had a couple of things on Friday. One, you had uh, gold change about $50 in one day. You had also Spain take over in terms of the major triggering mechanism to blow out the euro, uh, took over from the Greek situation. So if you add up all the debt in the Spanish situation, you're talking about a need for something like $1 trillion in the next round of bailout. One fourth of the value of their debt is due, uh, about 170 percent of their GDP. Greek, the Greek situation is far from over. Uh, you can just go down the whole list. And um, just to make one quote here, this um, mad mouthpiece, Jim Cramer uh, on CNBC, ranted on Friday as well. He said uh, the following. He said, "We need help. Obama and Bernanke." must have a conference call with the European leaders on Sunday and tell them to get their act together. Bernanke must announce that the Fed is opening, number one, a credit line for Europe, a Europe-wide bank bailout fund. Number two, a credit line for the European Central Bank to bail out all the European sovereign debt. And thirdly, a credit line for a new Marshall Plan for growth. Namely, it's 1923, hyperinflation, we've been in it for a while, and it's blowing. So, if you look at that whole financial bubble coming to a head with no solution, because the more you cut, the worse you make it. The more you impose the, the fascism, the more revolt you get. They put through the bill a uh, referendum in, in Ireland, and what do they do? They have the, the Sinn Féin and the whole party actually advances now to the biggest party. Same thing in Greece. There is no solution within the present monetary system. It's like Germany in 1923. The only thing you can do is step out of that system. That's where Glass-Steagall comes in. Glass-Steagall, like Roosevelt had to put through in 1933, separated those mountains of paper, the real from the bogus, and then you know, you can direct credit. The problem we have today, and this is why the war danger, I'll make one little short part on it, and then I'll go into what I want to get into here tonight as the title is kind of presumption. It says, how to rescue the future. And if you talk to most people today, they wouldn't even say there is one, much less one you can rescue. So, 
if you look at this situation like Germany in 1923 or the situation we have today, Glass-Steagall allows you to separate the two, the real from the bogus. And that's step number one, but as we'll get into, that is only step one, number one. Because if you take that step and don't do the other two, you're going under with the bad paper anyway. Now the other side of this is this crisis coming to a head is exactly what's driving the wars. What you have is the control of this monetary system, the old British monetary system, which is the extension of the of the Roman Empire, the extension of the Byzantine Empire up to the present. We were talking a little bit earlier here, why we have this history of warfare. Where do all these wars come from? Why are we fighting each other? Well, war is a policy of empire, permanent war, to control. So if you look at why the, the war is today, no matter what you do to stabilize, for example, Assyria, you have more levels unfolding, like our Susan Rice, our ambassador to the United Nations, just said that if the United Nations does not go to war and back up the Syrian uh, opposition forces, then, and the Russians and the Chinese back down from that support, then the United States should go to war on its own. Where does this come from? That's what she just said. She just said that, and at least we have in the United States a Joint Chiefs of Staff that is openly fighting this, and they drew the line on that immediately. And they basically hauled Panetta in and said, no, we're not, no way in hell are we going to war. And they pulled Panetta, and while he was on that plane, they told him, and then he came out with a statement saying, no, I can't envision that we would go to war without the UN. As Defense Secretary, I cannot see the, UN, the US troops in war without necessary support. In this case, UN support. So there's a war going on behind the scenes on whether the United States and the NATO forces that just met here get control of the military to force a back down of the Russians, back down, take the cuts, take the austerity. And they're running this fascist operation to maintain the system for this stupid little system that has, you know, the the Queen sitting on her throne for 60 years. I figure after 60 years there should be some movement by now and we can get some change. But what you have is this financial crash is directly the driver for this war. And what you have is networks throughout the United States, whether you look at the, the right wing, you know, like the, the, George, the John McCain's and the others who immediately saber, saber rattle, or whether you have the the Democrat side forcing the same thing. We've got a president, the reason I have number one there, we have a president that is actually excited about using drones to kill people. He, one thing, he's the laziest president we've had, and he sits there, and the only thing he can get really excited about is make every meeting, because he goes through the little, you know, ball player cards, looking down the names and gives the thumbs up and thumbs down. So we got to remove this guy for two reasons. One, for the violation of the Constitution, the position he's in, because he does sit on those Ohio-class submarines in the Pacific where you can do a preemptive strike. And secondly, he is a narcissist in that there is nothing going on in his mind except this, this manipulation, this grandiosity. And so he's the easiest thing to manipulate. So the biggest thing that's going to face us coming out of this discussion on solutions tonight is do we as a nation find the courage to use the Constitution and remove this guy either with the 21st Amendment, 25th Amendment Section 4 or with the, um, the impeachment clauses that he's a serial violator of the Constitution. Now that as the background, that we have a financial crash that could only be solved by getting out of that financial system. And secondly, it's the only way we're going to shift out of this war. And in that context, I want to actually center on what most people are looking on or looking for is a solution. Where does the solution start and how do we actually deliver it? And that's where a three-point program comes in. Now what most 
most people, I'm sorry, I might have to shift a little bit here. This is the Northern Hemisphere, as you can see, of the uh, North America. And this is what uh, was referred to in the sheet as the North American Water and Power Alliance. Basically, once you start with Glass-Steagall and you separate the real from the bogus, the first thing that's going to dawn on everybody yes. is we have a lot of monopoly money and very little real left. So immediately you're at that situation, well, what do you do next if you're not just going to go under with it? Well, you have to come back to the constitutional system where the, the government directs its own credit through the, like the first national bank and the second national bank we had until Jackson. And um, one of the things I've got with me is a journal that goes through detail by detail, the history, the credit policy, everything on this. But in an overview, even though you've got a credit policy, you cannot just pump money into the system. You can't just pick everything up and pay the paper. You've got to start moving back to a physical economy. So like we said earlier, you need something big enough, broad enough, and long enough in scope that can handle a 30 to 50 year reorganization of the economy in this directed credit manner. Now, the Parsons Engineering Company back in 1964, actually in 60, this is before Jack Kennedy was killed, was looking at the situation in the United States, the dropping of the water tables, the, uh, the overall water uh, shortages, and in looking around for a solution, they noticed that you have two major rivers, the Yukon River that flows out into the Arctic, and the Mackenzie that flows north out I mean, uh, the Mackenzie into the Arctic and the Yukon out through Alaska into the, uh, to the Pacific. Now, those two rivers drain 28% of all the snow and rain that falls on the, the northern hemisphere. It's primarily the evaporation off the Pacific in this whole area, and it hits, rains, and you immediately have the runoff. So it's all <coughs> wasted. never gets used a second time. Any place where you have water flowing in a different direction with vegetation and the recycling, it tends to be used, you know, 2.7 times. So the Parsons Engineering Company looked at this project and said, my gosh, if there's some way we could use that surplus in addition to desalination or whatever, there's a major part of the solution. So they looked around and they found here just above the northern uh, United States-Canadian border, above the border, a trench, the Rocky Mountain Trench, that's 150, I'm sorry, 500 miles long and it's 30 miles wide. So they said if we put a Hoover Dam structure in there and divert these flows through it over the Rockies, you could hold what eventually became, as they entered it out in 1963, 64, is 180 million acre feet of water flowing south and east, because that is also the continental divide change. So you can actually replenish, in terms of that Parsons engineering policy, way back in the 60s, you know, you could bring water down through the, um, you know, beef up the Colorado River, build new aquifers, there's 32 aquifers that are actually in the southwest. These are all detailed, you know, from tunnel systems, locks, dams, labor requirements, amount of concrete, earth moved, you name it. This project, Kennedy was for it, House and Senate were for it. It's one of the projects that ended with Kennedy's death and us being pulled into the Vietnam War. So if you look at the same wars today, in terms of how wars keep us out of real discussions, we've been living this collapse for the last 40 and more years. Bobby Kennedy killed right after that by those same forces. We got pulled into Vietnam, 10 years of war, we've never gotten out of that. We're now at the end of that whole cycle. We're at a situation where that money operation has shifted from a Roosevelt policy, a Kennedy, a Eisenhower, Addis for Peace program, uh, Apollo program, all that ended by 67, 68. And we've literally been producing nothing and more and more and more of this bubble structure. And Lyndon LaRouche comes on the scene as an economist in 58, detailing this shift of production, away from production, into speculation. So he's the only economist who details in 71, as we're forced off the gold standard, that this is what's actually going on. 
This policy we picked up in 71, 73, and it's been part of our policy ever since. There's a lot of people for it. It's now beginning to be picked up. The same way a year ago when I spoke here, remember we started talking about Glass-Steagall. And most people didn't remember Glass-Steagall or had no idea how it would work. But it's a tool against these financiers that have now reached their limit. They cannot save their system. But rather than giving up their system, they would rather blow the whole thing out. And they're actually, with this placement of missiles in... In Poland, they're actually setting up a system, if, if it goes the way they're planning it, would be in a position to actually take out second strike Russian missiles, and they know it. So they're not going to allow it to be put into place. So you've got this Cuban missile crisis in reverse building as well. So these tensions are all around these fights. Now, to stay on the solution side of this, this project, if we decided to build it, would put four million people to work immediately in the engineering and the skilled labor by technician level. Because this whole project has been engineered out and ready to go. All 369 projects, the dams, the um, tunnel systems, the pumping systems, since 64. So the decision to do it would put four million to work on those projects immediately and about two million to work in feeder industries as we gear up the concrete, the steel, and things like this. Aspects, once it gets underway, you take the, the youth in the United States. They have no skills. But if you take a Army Corps of Engineers beefed up by the returning troops from these dead-end wars and create a CCC structure where you hire on youth to train them as the CCC camps did, you can come out of this with engineers, you know, trained health officials, you name it, from that presently idle youth force. So this thing, as we decide to set this thing up, is ready to go. Now, the core question in this, this side you can see it can function. We, it, it's things we know how to do. The crisis we also see. The question is, how do you move from that one system of paper and you just put through Glass-Steagall and you have no credit. What is that middle role, which is what the whole of Chapter 3 in here, Section 3, goes through, is this return to an American credit system, where that, as a Roosevelt did, like a Lincoln did with the transcontinental rail lines, like a Hamilton did starting the nation, the credit that you outlay into these kinds of projects, what is the basis of that credit but the ability of your population to build it? So it's in the process of building this, like the Tennessee Valley Authority. As Europe was going under, Italy was going under, Germany was going under, Roosevelt didn't let the banks or the, London, the British run the policy. We basically built, eventually, things like the, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority and, and the various dams. The project itself paid itself off in terms of physical wealth. It's that concept that really takes a fight to get back to because it's been so long that we thought about production and physical economy as opposed to money. And see, if we stay within this money system, this nation will crash before this election. We will get this war before this election. So what's the election? The election's all a ruse of, again, a couple of candidates within the same monetary system. I mean, you take an Obama out, you put a Romney in, what do you get? You get the same monetary system. So the, the question is, we've got to change the way we as people think. We've got to master what is the American credit system. What is this history that allowed a Ben Franklin, a Hamilton, a Lincoln, a Roosevelt, even a Jack Kennedy as far as he went. Let's get this, which is the only thing, like I said, big enough, broad enough, and, and the key thing is ready to go. You can't have something that you're going to tack together in a number. If you need something that will fundamentally change, put six billion people to work at the start, changing the whole nation, but breaking the psychological notion that everybody's got to see they got a part of this, at least sharply down the road. And this thing is ready to go, and it will set the bases by which we can gear up. You know, development of the Arctic, things like the, um, the Bering Straits, there's things developments in Africa like this, you name it. Everything out here 
If the United States comes back to its senses, you have a Russia, a China, the United States nations participating in this kind of development. We have an incredible future. We have a lot of things scientifically to do and master. We've got asteroids coming in. We've got to be able to knock them off course if we have to. We can go into some of that in questions. But this project, like Glass-Steagall, there's 60 congressmen who signed on to Glass-Steagall. 64 actually now. We just, we just, I mean, there's hundreds of various unions and businesses and whatever. We just started calling up the community banks. Most community banks want Glass-Steagall. They didn't even know there was a bill on the table. I'm still 1489. So the, the problem is the media. The problem is the whole social political structure that's been manipulated by single issues as opposed to conceptions. And... There's a lot more detail I can go through here in terms of pumping stations and how things get diverted, where these things go, where the water comes from, where it ends up. But if we look at right now, look at the droughts and look at the flooding. Well, had we built this in the 60s, we wouldn't have that. Because you have literally canals that come across and stabilize the Mississippi and the Missouri River for year-round traffic so you can harness the flow. You have things that come back up and replenish the aquifers that have been... We have areas in this, uh, this nation that the water tables have dropped 55, 80, and some places over 100, 100 feet. So this replenishes it all because you've got literally, it irrigates area, areas like 19 million acre feet, new out west, where we have less than 20 inches of rain a year. So there's a lot of details people can go through, the problems that might come up, but we've got some of the top experts in the world already working on this. We have to put together the financial system in terms of these authorities like Roosevelt did and Lincoln did. We have the manpower out here, the major project directors. We have idle work that's got to be put together. This thing can go in one piece of emergency legislation. You put through Glass-Steagall, and you can't get Glass-Steagall without curbing Obama and, and this British layer. You make this shift, and with a authority set up like Roosevelt, like a Nawapa authority, that authority is going to outlay the funds in terms of this thing as it builds and projects. You could put six billion people to work the day you pass the bill. And see, that's what's got to come into the American society and thinking that we're not in a dead-end situation. We're not animals out here being played against each other by some controller of the, uh, the empire and herd. We're going to break this notion and come back to being scientific human thinking beings. And we can build this and we can build a lot beyond this. And um, rather than going more on, on detail, maybe I'll just throw it open for questions. I mean, it's... Um, okay, want to remove the uh, thing? Yeah. And get back behind the, uh, get back behind the podium. First one, tell us about the completion of Highway 1. What? I'm just curious about how no, much... That's off the subject. Chief, the, the, the thing that the Americans, we really have to do is we got to get back to ideas. Mm -hmm. It's not all things. We're either going to build this or we're going to be dead. We don't stop this lunacy that's presently drawing the line on the Russians and the Chinese. You're going to get thermonuclear war. As much as people want to say, nobody's crazy enough to do that. Well, some people think that the other guy's going to chicken out. Okay, Gene Horker. I think you mentioned H.R. 1489. You must have taken a look at the bill. Can you name some legislators or senators in Illinois who are co-sponsoring that bill? Yes, we have um, Danny Davis stand, signed on early, um, Jesse Jackson Jr., um, Jan Schakowsky, <coughs> Dan Lipinski, and across the border, Peter Biskowski. Biskowski. I think there's a four here in Illinois and the one, well, yeah, the one in Indiana. Thank you. 
Yeah, the best. Now, this project really will be a joint U.S. Canadian project because a good portion of that is up in Canada. How, uh, what's the view in Canada of this project? Well, in the 60s, they were ready to go for it. They were going for it, like the United States Congress. It was actually on track to be built. Uh, what's changed with the environmentalists and all these operations run by the British and others since, uh, some of that has to be um, reactivated. We just did a tour. We had a couple people in Alaska, two people in um, Montana, two people in North and South Dakota, four people in Idaho, where a lot of the pumping systems going to be built. And it was surprising here, it's only 40 years ago, and this thing was talk of the land back then, and practically nobody remembered it. So it's, it's this dumbing down of the population that has to be dealt with. But you're, they have a lot of benefits coming from this as well. You've got, um, you've got a canal that runs all the way across the uh, southern area of Canada over to uh, Lake Superior, stabilizing the Great Lakes. You have developments around the Hudson Bay. Um, there's a lot of power generated here. It's, um, if you put this together with the transit system with magnetically elevated trains and you're opening up the Bering Sea Tunnel that's uh, already being built on the, re re the Russian side, where you actually have the entire land corridor uh, development around the world. There's a couple of them being projected now through Gibraltar into Africa and, and Morocco, across the Horn of Africa, the big one in the Bering Straits. You can actually link up, and there's maps uh, for this, you can link up the entire landmass of the world except for Australia uh, with this magnetically elevated train system. Yeah? And what would the Prime, does the Prime Minister have a view of this? Which Prime Minister? Uh, Canada. Uh, Canada. Well, there's a faction for it, and there's a faction tied to the empire that's against it. And Canada still has the queen. They're uh, they're colony. Gene Anderson. Uh, this is a simple question from a simple question. And you don't have to go into, uh, you know, deep into it. the question I'm asking. But when you point out the rivers and flows from northern to south and Pacific and so forth and so on, obviously they've been flowing like this for Elon, what is the side effect when we go in as engineers and so forth and change that? Well, presently, you have it all is running off north. It's like 300, uh, 630 mil million acre feet a year. What you're basically taking is 20% of that and bringing it the opposite direction, holding in various aquifers, which are spelled out in, in the, the journal. So what you actually have eventually, you're taking this runoff, which then will, in, in the way it's being used now, where you have vegetation and uh, uh, multiple uses, it's going to actually multiply itself 2.7 times over in a number of uses before it runs back into the ocean somewhere downstream, this side on the continental divide. So, in terms of places like refurbishing uh, rivers that are already being used, like the Colorado, which is being drained down, it's totally over overused, or the uh, Pecos River, or things like this, you're actually going to increase the amount of hydroelectric power. You're going to create something like, I forget how many new reservoirs. You're going to totally augment animal life, vegetation, you name it, plus the irrigation on the... Um, you know, in terms of farming and whatever, this entire area, which is presently desert and drought, gets a, a big brunt of it. I think there's something like uh, 32 uh, reservoirs that are going to be created in the southwest. Um, you have some of it flows over and, and replenishes and reinforces some of the water from um, uh, California. So you implement this, and you implement the technologies that we have with desalination. You have a pumping system here in the um, Idaho area that's going to pump in one place, it's going to pump it up hundreds of feet using nuclear power to get it over the top. The original plan did that on water power alone. But you've got a, a completely... What's interesting about this is not just the water and the, um, and the jobs, 
It totally redefines the way man is looking at the earth, looking at himself. You look at the entire Arctic region undeveloped. Look at the resources up there, and the Russians are asking the United States for collaboration, where we begin using both the Bering Straits project, there's like a 60 mile wide, 68 I think here, the Bering Strait. It's like twice the length of the um, channel in England, but it's got two islands in the middle of it. So you can actually, it's an easier cut. But if you develop the entire region here, what are you doing but practicing developing an area which is presently incapable of sustaining man? Perfect testing ground, developing this in Africa and the deserts for developing areas like the, the moon with this massive amounts of tritium, and you can build a, uh, a, a mining colony, even if a lot of it's done by robots, and beyond. The question is, we as a human race face these kinds of challenges because there is no way the United States and the world is going to continue to function without moving to the next phase of energy flux density. Namely, right now we should have applied nuclear fission a long time ago, fusion and then anti matter, antimatter, different levels of energy flux density. We've got to come back to a scientific orientation. <coughs> but in terms of these things, a lot of that has worked out in the pamphlet. Right. Yes, uh, these, are, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. these studies were originally done in the 1960s when the notion of global warming was by and large unheard of. Have uh, environmental studies been ongoing and has the uh, possible impact on global warming been evaluated? Well, global warming, a la Al Gore, and a la the British Environmentalist Network, is an anti uh, science operation. There is no such thing as global warming created by mankind's technology. What you have is the biggest problem we have right now is the Earth and the solar system is in a, in a, in a flux, as it always is, through the galactic plane. And what has we've recently moved into is a period where we're actually in that process above the plane, and there's various things I can show you on that. So we're getting more radiation and, and other kinds of things, but we're in a, in a cycle of this plane that corresponds to the major kind of flux changes in life on the Earth. Some people call it the, the major kills of various species and things like this. So what I'm getting to is there's all kinds of dynamics. What runs the Earth weather is much more determined by the sun and the galaxy and cosmic radiation than any minuscule things that we're affecting. It's a concoction. Mike Foley? Yeah. Maybe, oh, uh, I, maybe I missed something. But you seem, to, you seem to think there's this enormous war coming soon. Maybe you're not saying that, but anyway, if, if you are talking about some enormous war that's coming soon, what what is involved in this war? What's this war going to be? And how is this water project going to stop it from happening? Well, the war is actually already here, and we've been in it in a quite intense uh, manner ever since Gaddafi was toppled illegally by this Obama British French operation, and then he was similar, summarily executed, totally in violation of any kind of Geneva Code, U.S. Constitution, U.N. Code. Now, what was what was going on there? Why did this guy? Why was he just executed? Was he just going to get on the stand and say things that uh, he shouldn't have said if they put him on trial? Well, it's a bit more than that, in that if you look at the financial crash, this financial network needs to back down nation states, the same way they've taken over Europe since the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the uh, Soviet Empire. They pretty much consolidated and took sovereignty from all the European nations with this matrix and now the Euro operation. Similar kind of operation, they took over policy in the United States, uh, pretty much from Roosevelt and the killing of, the stopping of Eisenhower and the killing of, of Kennedy. 
So they pretty much dominated the financial policy here, whether you look at a book of the, the Bush administrations or whether you look at Obama now. It's run by the Booth School out of the University of Chicago and the British, and they're running these austerity policies. George Shultz, I mean, he ran both administrations. He's running this one in, in that sense. So the war is this use of the Syrian and then the uh, Iranian wars to be the triggers to force a confrontation with Russia. What you have with Syria is Russia is drawing the line, no more Libyas. China's backing them up, no more Libyas. There is no reason to be against Iran. There is no nuclear program since 2003. There is no weapon system. So what are we putting weapons in Poland for, these defense systems? Well, they're structured to be able to catch that second strike of the, uh, the Russians, and they know it. So we've been in a Cuban missile crisis at a growing rate of intensity ever since that Gaddafi killing. Because LaRouche laid out, it's not about Gaddafi, it's not about Syria and Iran, it's about triggers like the British ran in setting up World War I. You know, where did World War I come from? You had Lincoln's rail policy, not only developed the United States, but it was spreading into Europe, spreading into Russia, transcontinental railroads going everywhere. What was going to happen to the British Empire's control of the landmass? Well, it was over. And they knew it was over. And they write about it. You can find it in their writings. So they orchestrated out of the Balkans fights that isolated Germany and threw it into World War I and busted it out. And that's what they're doing today. The Balkans, I mean, the Middle East is the modern-day Balkans. Now, how do we change this? Well, you get the British off our nuclear capability. How do we do that? You remove Barack Obama, and although there are other agents, they do not have control. Same thing with the economic policy. So where the, the particular project ties in, it's a decision by the American people to come in behind the solution in the consent of the governed and force a shift in policy back to the principles of our constitutional wealth creation. All right. Kurt Mayer? Yeah, I question your interpretation of history, particularly the TWA uh, building of the dams. The, we didn't, that didn't get us out of the Depression. It was the Second World War that did it. And certainly these projects don't change the economy. They just put us further in debt. Yeah. What is the debt that we owe on the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority? Nothing. Oh, how did that work? Uh, my point was that we didn't pull out of the Depression. Right. That lasted until the beginning of World War II. What actually happened is we carried the cost of World War II. Wars don't produce anything that's of value. We carried the cost of World War II. We fed the entire world. We ran the entire land lease program. And we come out of the war, and did we keep that productive capability? No, Roosevelt died, Truman, a flunky from Wall Street and the British, was already president, and we shut down as fast as they could get away with that whole industrial capability. So Kennedy comes along, he's uh, leaning in the other direction, they can't get him to go into another war, so they kill him, and it's, it's stopped again. But World War II, Tennessee Valley Authority, worded, here's the question that we get to in Section 3. Where in the middle of the Depression, everything broke, things in Europe going fascist, where did the so-called money come from to build that project? Treasury. No. Oh, yes. Well, in, in one sense, yeah, but it was, a, it was a credit directed to the project that produced the wealth as you build it that retired to debt. Yes, but it didn't get us out of the Depression. And that's the point you're making with your project. Right, so you need something big, and it's got to be sustained. The problem is they ran the war to stop those kinds of projects. Roosevelt actually built the United States' capability of fighting the war by the CCC programs, everything. He didn't start with a, a clean-cut program, but he knew that you had to invest in people and not allow the banks and the fascists to run it. That's the decision we have to make today. you got this silly operation going on all over the city. Preckwinkle, Rahm Emanuel, cut this, cut this. Everybody's in a fight trying to save this particular thing, and that's all right. But see, you can't win it by fighting single issues. 
you've got to actually come back to a credit policy that allows something to be produced. Then you'll have a tax base. All right. Well, Freedom. Okay. Can you, explain, can you explain something to me about number one to remove right, Barack Obama? Obama using the 25th Amendment. Can you explain to me how your group feels that he is mentally and morally incompetent and how you expect to use the 25th Amendment, Section 4, to do it when I have not heard of this happening anywhere? I mean, nowhere. I have never heard of him being removed because of mental incompetence or well, you actually had the question come up when they removed, or Nixon removed himself before he got removed. Oh, come on. Yeah. No. And yeah. the difference is, I don't know whether Nixon had the brains to remove himself. I don't know if this guy does. Now, the reason I say that is you look at his history, and there's extensive stuff we have on our site. Barack Obama is a classic case of a magnificent narcissist, namely... There, it's not just he's got an inflated ego, it's not just that he thinks a little bit too much of himself. He is a, a narcissist of the quality like a Nero. There is no emotional connection to other human beings. It's a real disease, and that's why he was picked. Because in this kind of a crisis and a collapse, he is not going to make a decision to operate on the general welfare. If you look at, I mean, we've had the Hitler mustache on Obama for over two years uh, for the, the medical program. It's a classic case of the T4 program, the British policy that Hitler implemented in 1932-33, the medical program of uh, Nazi Germany. No, I didn't know. It's not about health, it's about budget cuts and taking people off of various kinds of access. Look at the moves to stop, you know, tests for breast cancer, prostate cancer, if whole categories of people f falling out of the category, if their life's not worthy to be lived. But this narcissism, I mean, you can go through the, the wars without clearing it in Congress. The Libya war, the, the most uh, clear one. You can uh, look at the way he's taken down Congress, where you have now 12 individuals hand-picked to make the decisions that the Congress should make in terms of budgets. You can go down item after item after item, these, uh, these various boards. But the, in all these, all these violations of the Constitution, what is the, 25th Amendment? the 25th Amendment was put in after Jack Kennedy was shot. There was a problem that set up as what if Jack Kennedy would have lived. So how do you, you have an alive president, he's still president, but he's not functioning. So they passed the 25th Amendment, which allows the executive branch to make a decision that the president is not competent and he is then removed. That is it. He is the executive branch. He is not. The, he is a president. The presidency of the United States is bigger than the president. It's the entire cabinet. It's uh, former presidents. It's all kinds of things. We do not have a nation in the Constitution that's one man king, he's king for four years, I can do everything I want, and then if I haven't been able to consolidate a, a dictatorship, then somebody else gets it. This, and this is that's the problem the way he thinks. He thinks that he has the right, and the problem is the littleness and the stupidity and the cowardice of the population that has allowed him to get away with that. It allowed this Congress that has allowed him to get away with that. You know, the, the, the Senator Kerry is a pick one who can knuckle under on every kind of setup and haven't had the guts. Now, there are a couple of congressmen, just to make it quick, like Walter Jones, a, a congressman out of uh, North Carolina, and uh, Senator, he's a Republican, and a Senator Democrat, uh, Webb out of uh, Virginia, that are now beginning to um, draw the line. Any war, any move for war that this guy does, or any president does, without the explicit okay of the Congress, is a violation and it should be impeached. Now, whether the Congress got the guts to do that is another question. Our next question is from Rex. Lynn is what, 89, pushing 90 years old now? He's running ahead of 90. Yeah, and my, my understanding is he's not even in the country anymore. He hasn't been for a while. People should quit making things up. Lynn has been here full time. Okay. He does go to Europe because it's the easiest way right. to deal with some of those nations as opposed to 
But Lewis is here in the United States. So who do you propose to replace uh, Obama? Have you been able to talk Webster Tarpley into running for president yet? See, the, the thing that American people have to do is kind of figure out that we've got to do something besides look for the next guy on the White House. We have to actually say, we are the people of the United States. We have to form a more perfect union. So, the question is, how do you build this policy? In the course of building this policy, you're going to have people rise to a political fight. Those are the people you look. We have from now to November, we want to come up with a president. Who's running as a presidential candidate? Nobody. We have to create a policy. Now we have a th third of the Senate running. We have a full House all along. And we have the president. So let's create a stampede on this necessary policy that creates the conditions where we then, as a population, pick somebody that's going to remove Obama. It's obviously constitutionally going to be Biden. But it'd be a Biden and in a different context. He's tends to be a team player. You change the team, right? So the question is, how do we get the policy? Right. All right, Elizabeth Witt. Yeah, I'm, I'm so amazed at all your um, knowledge. And I, my hand is spinning. I'm having a hard time following because I don't know my history like you do. But I have a question in regards to this project and the idea. Uh, it, it's so um, important for us to get on board. Uh, would you consider uh, a good idea to maybe um, get your message out to um, like humanitarian organizations, churches, civic organizations? You know what I mean? What like you know the the, or, the structure is already built there in churches and synagogues and humanitarian organizations if they just get the message. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, this. And everything else we put out, we go to all these groups. In fact, I just spent the last three days part of a team calling up every community banker, in the United, not every banker, but every banker association head. We've done the same thing with unions. We've done it with churches. The key thing here, if anybody ever wanted to know why there's a slander on the roof, it's exactly that. Because as soon as you somebody says, well, that's a great idea, and then you say, Linda LaRouche, well... We don't touch that. And you see, again, this empire, you look at the various attacks on people and being knocked out of politics or whatever, you look at this sustained fight that Lyndon LaRouche has waged. I mean, most people have no idea that Lyndon LaRouche is the scientist that Ronald Reagan adopted the idea and then the policy and then it got put through in the United States as the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that was then offered to the Russians by Reagan. It was rejected by the Russians under Andropov and Gorbachev, British agents. So it never went through. And the interesting thing now is you've got a Putin government and the Russian scientists offering that same defensive system back to the United States with the included factor of this defense of the Earth, these capabilities of dealing with asteroids. It's being publicly offered as a program. Putin sat down with Bush Sr. and Bush Jr. offering this back when Bush Jr. was still president. And it's been systematically rejected by the kind of stranglehold on science in the United States. It's the same kind of fight with the nuclear fight. Bob Matter and then Charles. Okay, so um, you, you plan on financing this big water project through future income taxes on, on, on taxpayers? No, no, see, it had nothing to do with taxes. The credit of the United States, and that's what we deal with in, in Section 3 here. The United States, when it was founded, we fought a war against the British, people know that. We come out of the war and every state in the Union was in debt. They were, we had a Articles of Confederation, the same British, the same Swiss, the same oligarchy were tearing the nations apart, pitting the states against each other. So, what you had with both Franklin and then also especially a young 20-some-year-old Alexander Hamilton, you have a genius that said, well, look, they're facing this situation like we face with all the cities and the states here today. They were all broke. But Hamilton said that debt is not their debt. It's not the debt of the states, it's the debt of the nation because we fought an American Revolution effectively. 
So let's centralize that debt. Let's form a national bank which allows them with that housing of the debt that will give these states credits for canals, for railroads, whatever. And they produce the physical economy, they retired that debt in record rates. It's the same thing we have today. If you take the entire debt of the states across the United States, and that's closing down in all these budget cuts, it's about 180 billion bucks, less than we gave one bank, AIG, right? So if we had this authority, if we actually made a government decision that we're going to take these debts that are a direct result of those bailouts, where we put $30 trillion in the bailouts of these derivatives on these Wall Street and international banks, or like I read earlier, where Bernanke and these guys were saying we should have a direct credit line for the Fed, and it's not that they're proposing it, they're already doing it. But all this debt that the states have lost because of these payments that we're sitting here, we can't run fire departments, we can't run schools, you name it. Well, freeze that debt, put it in a Chapter 11, just freeze it. That's what Glass-Steagall does. It allows us to separate the real from the bogus. The tax base in the, the banks, that's real. You know, pensions are real. But, you know, the derivatives are not real. It's a gambling debt. So to, to do this, you're going to use this credit structure, and this is where it gets tricky. Credit is not equivalent to a credit card. Credit is a, an intention to build something. The intention and the ability of the American people to build this project, that's how it's going to get paid. It's, it, we gotta, even I just said paid. It's not about money. It's about... What are you going to come out of this? You're going to come out with a water system, a better agricultural system, a trained youth force, you name it, right? Well, maybe we have a follow-up on that. Would you agree that land values are going to go up as a result of this? It yeah, probably would, but see, it's the wrong way to look at it. Right. All right, but oh. I'm still having a hard time getting my head around this. You know, somebody's going to have to pay for this. I mean, these workers need dollars to go to the store buy food. Well, you set up an authority that actually operates this thing and gets it moving and the the production of particular stages of it is going to have caused a real change in it, yeah you're going to actually pay a wage off of this this credit line you know it's like the tennessee valley authority they we built our way out of it and within a record number of years i think it was less than 25 we paid off the entire outlay of credit for the tennessee valley authority so what's what's it been doing ever since it's been paying for itself in our own lifetime, we put together the Apollo program, and then it went to the NASA program. What did NASA cost us? For every dollar we put into this, we got you know fourteen and fifteen dollars in spend. How much is it going to cost? All right. Don't think in money. Think in terms of the physical. The money is the tool. In terms of money, Charles. Yeah, Ron. This was designed in the fifties. Subsequent to that, the Arctic has been melting. Those rivers depend on snowfall. There's no snow falling. There's no water. What are you going to pump? The water comes from the evaporation off the Pacific and then the refalling of that water. There's a cycle here which is a much bigger cycle than the one we have here, only we're going to take that surplus and we're going to create a broader cycle over the entire uh, western area. It's not snowing. It's not, it's not just, it could be rain. First of all, the Arctic isn't changing that much. And if the Arctic were changing... It's warm. Okay. <laughs> So the question is, human beings are even capable of understanding that. We could go to the middle of Africa. There's Africa. We've got the Congo River that runs out into the uh, Atlantic Ocean, one of the biggest, most powerful rivers. And right across those mountains from the Congo, there is the whole former Lake Chad area and, and the desert. Well, a similar pumper system and this Lake Chad project could take that over the mountain. You could make Africa a breadbasket. Should have been done a long time ago. It's been on the books for a long time. Why have they not been built is this bigger question of the empire. The problem is we sit here and we talk in the abstract, 
And we haven't run our own country for a long time because we don't run our own credit. And when people bring that up, it gets to be a scary situation. You start bringing up the question of Jack Kennedy, not only that he was killed, but why didn't we actually force an investigation? Can I get a follow-up? I can wait. I don't care. Oh. Yeah. Oops. Oh, well, that, that's I've been up in that area, and those are called classified as wilderness areas. And the reason they're wilderness areas is because that's pretty inhospitable terrain. And you get the focal point of your entire project is the most inhospitable terrain you can find on the earth. Do you think this like a park? <laughs> well, what's really interesting is when you're going to make a lot of it like a park, you've got the Russians right now building a city up in Umkab, called Umkab, but an island in the Arctic. They're going to actually make it. They're using the actual structure of the space station to do it. We're going to study a lot, a lot of those dynamics and the minerals and everything. But what's interesting is you actually get the thermonuclear fusion and a few things. You can get a plasma torch, which is going to make it quite easy to mine some of these things far beyond what we presently consider mining. The problem is we've gone to sleep mentally for 40 years. I've heard of references for um, nuclear power, specifically fusion. Uh, what are your views on thorium and the reactors that they are on that type of nuclear power? They're perfectly useful. In fact, uh, the Indians have a massive amount of thorium, and they're developing quite efficient systems right now. The problem is we've got a, a lunacy out here that scares people that says nuclear power can't be used because of X, Y, and Z when um, those breakthroughs have been made. We've got to make a rapid transition to, to thermonuclear fusion and then to what's called matter-antimatter. The question in all this is the question of energy density. You know, if you're burning trees and you move to coal, you change the density in terms of your level of heat. Same thing with oil. So you can move up the scale, but you're also moving up in terms of capabilities. Like I mentioned, there's a plasma torch where you have the ability to literally centrifuge out components of uh, regular rock. So I mean, the real challenge here is in terms of our breakthroughs in thought, taking a region like this and actually making it habitable as a stepping stone to the things we've got to do beyond. Okay. Mike? Mike Latour? Uh, there's two ways to bankrupt any country around the world, drugs and oil, with that combination of petrochemical fields, IG Farben and Standard Oil. Oil is a drug. The last time oil per barrel was in the 80s, we were paying about 225 a gallon for gas. The other day it was $86 a barrel, and we're paying $4 a gallon for gas. Uh, you got some kind of solution for this thing? <coughs> well, the key thing there, if you look at uh, drugs, and that's including the other kind of drugs and oil, it's also run by this empire. The Royal Dust Shell and British Patrol. It's, right. it's really one of the means of control. But we've had a capability of producing fuel, hydroid, hydrogen fuels, out of spin-offs from the power of a nuclear power plant for a lot of time. We should, have, we should be running on hydrogen fuels. We should be using the uh, petroleum for different kind of, uh, you know, other kind of aspects. But yeah, see, again, it's the control of a system, like they control it through a monetary system. Uh, yeah. All right, Mike Foley. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if I got the. I'm not sure if I got my information right, but I think I think there's a guy named David Rockefeller. I think he's still alive. I think he's about probably in his 90s. Yeah, David. I think he used to be head of the Chase Manhattan Bank for many, many years. He's an alcoholic. Well, I think he also might have been emperor of a large part of this planet. I wonder if you're familiar with this or if you have any thoughts and feelings or if the LaRouche organization has any feelings toward the Rockefeller Empire. Well, we, uh, we fought uh, the Rockefellers all through the, uh, the 60s and the 70s. We, they're piggy banks for this bigger operation. You know, do you think that the Rockefeller family really runs a large part of the planet, or do you think they might be like flunkies for whoever is running the show? 
There is one empire, and that's the extension in various phases of the old British, the Roman Empire, which is presently today the British Empire. Now, when I talk about the British Empire, I'm not talking about the British people. We're talking about this this interface network: grain cartels, oil cartels, central banks, derivative operations. You know the. Um, control of the drug trade. I mean, who are we standing there in Afghanistan, you know, protecting the uh, the opium fields for, but the, the whole British operation that runs 92% of the opium, you know. And um, again, we have key allies in Russia that has, you know, millions of uh, addicts per year, and we've got the Iranians right there with 25% of their population addicted to opiates. They'd love to have some kind of uh, help shutting that down. So this, this empire, the Rockefellers are like a piggy bank. It's a Tory crowd in the United States. It goes back to people like uh, Aaron Burr and this whole bunch that were um, British and Swiss operatives in the United States that never got cleaned up. Yes, Charles. Yeah, Ron, um, I think one of the largest single public works projects was the Hoover Dam and um, whenever you guys get done, you know. Okay, just a minute. Your minute is up, man. Don't worry, Charles, we can hear you. You can talk three times louder, man. Yeah. All right, the Hoover Dam is the largest thing, and my understanding is it generates electricity, but it's never going to pay for itself. And are you... Say, say, mister, I paid to come in here. All right, you're quiet now. All right. But the... it'll never pay for itself. Hoover uh, Dam? Yeah. You done any figuring? That's what the tour guide says. Lucky <laughs> 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 you got you back. Uh, Santa Claus. Who's the tour guide uh, working for? Anyway, that's not it. We've got, I mean, you got other examples, like the Three Gorges Dan in China. You know, I we, guess for every example, there's a counter example. But give me an example of a nation that ever built its own river for hundreds of miles from the Canadian border to... Really, Albuquerque? We could have all kinds of man altered nature, planet, you name it. The question is, we got to come back. project of that magnitude. We haven't thought big in a lot of years. No. And we're now in a situation with the financial crash and the need to pull nations together and this nation together around this. we got to think at this level or we're not going to make it. This is the only thing that will house enough credit for 30 to 50 years, allowing us to change the entire direction again, back to something real. Presently, at best, we're operating on band-aids on a crashing situation. And that just ended this weekend with the hyperinflationary blowout at a Weimar Germany level in Europe. And guess who holds the bond guarantees on all that paper? But the Are US there any man-made rivers on Earth? And I'm not gonna they call them canals. Yeah. Uh, that's not a river. Canal. The oh, L.A. River. Tim, oh, did you get your question? Oh, yeah, I, got, I got my question, yes. <laughs> All right. Who does not, did not get their question in? Let's go to rebuttals. Um, yes. Andy Anderson. I'm, I'm still missing the concept of how, how fast do you think that uh, nuclear power can make a difference in providing the energy to build this thing. At present, nuclear power doesn't provide that much compared to the entire mix in America. Well, that would be part of the construction project. How many nuclear power plants are you envisioning building in that <laughs> to run that project? Well, the um, the one right there at the um, pumping station at the Sawtu lift, I think, has uh, four. I think That's four reactors. Yeah. And how, how fast, without any regulation or government interference from Obama or anywhere else, how fast do they envision getting these new nukes online to get power out of them to start to run this, uh, build this project? Well, there are standard uh, plants now that have, you know, can be certified because they they can basically build them as modulars and just move them there. You have um, 
Again, a lot of those details are already worked out. There's a massive care operation in, in the public. There's a number of places, I mean, if you just look at running this kind of thing, gearing up the energy system, rebuilding Detroit so it can produce something, building these magnetically elevated trains and powering them. We need, uh, we need a lot of power immediately. We're going to develop the world to this kind of level to be able to deal. We need about 6,000 nuclear power plants as fast as we can get them. Now, the question is, it's not a matter of how do you go over there and you build each one individually. We have a capability now of mass producing these things. Some of these big plants in, in Detroit, the ones sitting on the rivers, should have been retooled, take the same workforce there that's producing pumps and things for autos, retool it, and literally mass producing these things and floating them out. We don't even have a capability in the United States of building the cores. One of the biggest things we've got a problem in the United States is transformers of the bigger level. That if we got hit with one of these electrical storms or that would knock out, I mean, Japan produces these things. I think Germany produces some of these big transformers. We don't produce them anymore. We just sit in the dark for, you know, a year and a half, you know? It's, we're just, I mean, if, once you start looking at the size of the problem, you start saying, okay, how do we organize ourselves efficiently as a society, not just to do, get ourselves moving, but we got to train a generation of kids quite quickly, because the people who actually know how to do a lot of this bigger stuff, they're at their 70s and 80s. And now, this project is, is obviously 30-something years and, and longer, but getting it started immediately sends us in the other direction. So they were uh, at 6 million people to get started. Yeah, that's oh, where they're saying you know, they're, they're the jobs. A lot of the people are unemployed, coming out of the military right now. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of young people are come out of college. Well, not not just that in the first stage. The first stage would be the engineers, these these technicians that would go to these project sites and immediately get them moving. In the next year, or two. immediately. See, we really don't have that kind of time. People are thinking. When we talked earlier. When I said the financial system is disintegrating, it's like Germany in 1923. You woke up one morning, there were no currencies. At least in Germany, it wasn't a currency. Now, what are you going to do at that point? How are you going to have a society that functions? Can you still control it politically? Now, the other side is running and creating all these kinds of occupy things and whatever with no content to play them all against each other. They don't care how the United States goes down. They want to be on top of what's left. And see, we don't know who the enemy is. That's our problem. We've been kind of bouncing around, picking this issue and that issue. They, they've run us by single issues. You pick an issue, you get people to take sides, get all emotional about the two sides, but you can't solve anything with a single issue. You have to step back a little bit and say, well, who's been running that policy? Who's been running the wars? Who's been running the financial derivatives as opposed to production? And see, once you look at that, then you begin seeing LaRouche as the individual who stood in the middle of all this and said all along, uh, this is what's right. Okay, I guess. Yes, Bernie? Yes, uh, your argument seems to be predicated on, amongst other things, I think you said 6,000 nuclear power plants. Is there Worldwide. any way to do this without this uh, nuclear power? I remain unconvinced that nuclear power is going to ever be safe. Well, you're wrong. We disagree. We can what disagree, but then there's a question in science of truth, which one's true and which one's not. And that's where we get into a lot of problems these days, because people say opinion's okay. A lot of people in Japan will argue that the nuclear is not very safe. No. Some of them would. But most of them, they're building it. They'd like to have the United States. Let's put a moratorium on it. Yeah. Yeah. Bernie, you have a very soft voice. I'm not sure that everybody hears what you say. Charles? I live east of the Mississippi River. I don't perceive how this project benefits us in any way, shape, or form. We have all the water we need. Why should we pay for this? And I'm like Bob, somebody's got to pay for this. It's not going to pay for itself. Are they going to build those... Uh, They're certainly not in a century. Are they going to build those pipes and those uh, various kinds of components out there on the side of the um, Idaho mountains? 
Are they going to, where are they going to get it from? Chicago. Chicago? Who said Chicago? I don't care about Idaho Mountain. No, 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 I, you didn't hear the question. You said, where are they going to, I said, where are they going to get the manufacturing that produces the pipes and everything and the wiring and all the machines? Overseas. In China. No, right here. Right here. In Chicago. China. China. So they're going to be busy building their own situation. They're way ahead of you right now. So the, the question is, if you look at the entire machine tool capability here in the United States, if we'd have used it a little bit earlier before we shut down the auto plants, you actually go back a couple of years, we had, you know, the number of auto plants sitting idle, and then what did we do is we shut down that capacity. I can take you to plants in Indiana where they shut it down and sold it off. Listen, that infrastructure is for the West. Why should we pay for it? Why should we, you aren't as the populated areas for these no places? Why should we pay for I, this I got an stuff? answer. We're going to make the plastic bottles and the labels that say no apple water. Yeah. And we're going to sell that stuff. All right. All right. <laughs> so the question is, see, we, we, we tend to lighten everything up because we don't want to actually think about those bigger consequences if we don't do this. You are in a thermonuclear confrontation right now with the Russians because they're being told by this British network that runs this little president that they have to back down and not support these kinds of ideas. They can't support Syria. They can't do any of this. The opposition in Syria is run, funded, financed by the British and the Saudis. And who are they funding? They're funding Al-Qaeda. We're having arguments that we should go in and defend Al-Qaeda, toppling a government for the British to fight the Russians. Why do we get so suckered? Because we've become little thinkers. You look at this, you say, six million jobs. I don't care who gets them, let's get them going because it'll create something else. It'll put the entire nation to work, like we did with Roosevelt in the, uh, in the 30s. Now the problem is, we came out of the war, Roosevelt died, we got Truman, and we shut down the entire industrial capability that should have built the new Panama Canal, industrialized Africa, built the new pa the, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority in Laos and Cambodia. Why did we get in that war? Well, there was a water project that they stopped. So what we got to do is actually get a little bit of distance on ourselves and say, how in the world did we end up so dumb? Well, they orchestrated it. They gave people everything they wanted not to think. Now we can fix that. We can start thinking. But let's do it now. Let's make this shift. Well, I have a question. Uh, frequently, uh, states get <coughs> overextended financially because they put a lot of money into some project that's going to make them rich. And uh, then they're in debt to the World Bank, the IMF, uh, bankers generally. Uh, isn't it quite possible that uh, this Nawapa uh, might be just the, have the same result for the United States. Well, you said that states put themselves into a project that uh, got them in debt. Now, what was yes. that project? Well, the new casino, oil, oil, yeah, good. the uh, militarization. Uh, uh, the uh, third baseball uh, highway system, uh, uh, water projects. Well, if you look at it a little bit different, we had states that functioned. You had people who were paying taxes, and you had schools, and you had hospitals. It never worked perfectly. The city of Chicago would never worked perfectly, but it worked. Now the problem is, we have a financial system since the killing of Kennedy, and then since is based on speculation. We've shut down the stockyards, we've shut down the steel mills, we've shut down everything produced here. We farm it out because they convinced us we get it cheaper. Right, we'll see, uh, 
So, what do we have? We have a situation where there is no tax base in the states. So what do they do? They say, well, we're paying too much on pensions, you know, things that people have, that we can carry if you're actually producing something. So they let everybody against each other. Do we ever cut the interest on the debt? Do we ever change the, the money structure? No. We're totally gullible going along with the empire's monetary system. And they have every different version of monetarists out here. You have discussion clubs on monetarist theory. And it's all now been proven to be bankrupt. Let's go to rebuttals. Uh, Charles has the last question. All right. I, there's only... How many questions are you going to give this guy? Yeah, right. We're time. There's only, uh, there's only five uh, railroads that made it through the Rocky uh, Mountains. Yeah. All right. And these are not the Appalachians. Uh, I've been in TVA. But You've had several you, you, Are you calling on me? Well, let him finish his question. Let him finish what, his question. What kind of place is this? It's called a dictatorship, so Charlie. What are you calling me man. for? An empire. <laughs> it's an empire. Oh, it's and then you told me, no, wait a minute. You call on me and then you say, don't ask questions. Well, you losing it or what? <laughs> why did you call on me? And then tell me not to. What kind of chair is this? You call on somebody, you let them ask like a question. You had questions. I had two. Let him finish his question. That's too fucking mad. You don't call on somebody and then say no. Okay, let him finish his question. Oh, fuck. At least I talk on the topic, not about health bullshit. You're going to talk on Napa? You're going to talk about eating beans? Well, let Charlie go ahead. If oh no, I thought you called on me. Yes, I did. Well, then why but didn't you I change your mind? Saw that Kurt had his hand up. He had his hand up. So you just interrupt somebody and say, shut up? I'm, you could have asked your question. You don't you like right. being yeah. interrupted. No, that's sure stupid. Ask the fucking question. Ask already. the fucking question. All right. How do you Would you either ask your question or let... Kurt well, you're the guy you interrupted. You apologize if you interrupt somebody. And you say, I'm sorry. And you got no reason for interrupting. All right, now, why are you, you're going to go through the Rocky Mountains? Those are not Appalachian TVA. Those mountains are 15,000 people, 15,000 feet high, above the tree line. There's not even air up there. The railroads couldn't get through them. There's five routes through the whole Rocky Mountains. You're going to have your whole project in the heart of that? I'm not a geologist, but that's well, not a park. Well, we don't have to go everywhere in those mountains. And places where we can go over, we have boring equipment we can go through. You're going to go through a 15,000... If we, if we have to, maybe it's not necessary. With what? But especially what we're going to do is actually move beyond, um, we'll probably go to something like magnetically elevated trains, which actually um, make those mountain passes much easier, even with freight. We've got to do a lot of double tracking to get what we need from here out there. This is all written up in the report. The question is, the bigger question here is we've got to take up a, a, a challenge that, you know, we're not going to get out of this unless we start thinking differently. And that's got to start right now because we're in it right now. We're in the crash, we're in the war danger, and we've got to change the politics in the United States so that we have a policy that can actually lead the nation. Paul, what is this Rocky Mountain ditch? It's just a valley in the, the Rocky Mountain Trench. It happens to be a valley. That's a valley now that's... Useful if you make it a reservoir. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, Kurt Meyer. Yeah, you mentioned that our country is falling apart. How much has China and the Chinese imports, cheaper merchandise, plastic ship, have to do with it? Nothing. 
They've produced for a market that we no longer fill. We got suckered into thinking that at least people running the policy, not everybody at the ground level, that we'd get it cheaper, therefore it's better. Uh, so they, um, they produced for that market. It wasn't good for them either. And they're learning that. They're changing away from that slave labor production for goods in the United States. And they took LaRouche's advice, and now they're building infrastructure for the development of their own people. And that's the difference. They'd like to know, well, where the hell is the United States? Why don't you come back to your own system? Okay. Now, they actually just put up a uh, space station. Um, they had a docking. I don't know if people saw that. Yeah. They, uh, when they had their two vehicles dock, what did they play? What was the music? Dark's the Pink Banner. <laughs> It was either that or the America the Beautiful. Yeah. See, right. We we have to actually quit being manipulated by every little button they want to push. All right. Oh, this is a big Bob button. matter. Yeah, I wonder if you could uh, uh, tell me a little bit about desalination plants and the, maybe the state of the art. What's going on with those now? Know. It seems like it might be. It's going to be a whole lot of energy and effort to do that. If your goal is to get fresh water, can't uh, can't you have desalination plants? You got a whole damn ocean right right down there. Well, we need it all, and all that's on the Google. People complain that we should take other things tonight. But the question is, we should be doing all that. Okay, let's go to rebuttals. All right, we will go to rebuttals. How many have comments to make? Uh, yes, Tim, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. Maybe nice. about six minutes each. All right. Uh, you can go up to six minutes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank our speaker. Frank, Frank wants a job on the dam. Oh, yeah, one of them. One of the nuclear reactors. Uh, if we get conversations, I, I would like to, to see that the people who were paying attention and thinking found this presentation shallow, uh, repetitive, keep saying the same thing over and over again without going into anything more. It seems to me that this project is like the life preserver of this group. They, they, they hang in on to this big thing to, to justify their existence. Um, the Three Gorges Dam is one of the biggest disasters that human uh, engineering have mm, been able to produce. Uh, the Jansi River is one of the major rivers in the world, and it doesn't reach the sea now. Uh, the consequences of not reaching the sea have to be understood as that every river supplies the uh, nutrients for the fisheries, the life on the sea. And when you remove that, then you just kill that immense amount of life that is in the mouth of the river. Uh, the, one of the environmental officials of China, when I was in, in uh, Portugal, he, he said in one of the conferences that there were about, uh, it was a humanist, humanist uh, idea, idea that he went into the University of Lisbon um, to, to try to see that the world get united into a more uh, humanist way of looking at things. And this uh, official of the Chinese government says, with this project we are killing ourselves. That's what we're doing. Uh, the disaster was not only on the sea, but was also the uh, life on the river, all the different uh, birds and insects and everything, uh, because the flow of the river was changed from an abundant flow uh, at periods of time in the spring and so on, 
where the animals uh, do their, their things, uh, that was altered and, and reduced to nothing. So a lot of life died there. But 200 miles around the lake that they formed, 200 miles for any coast of it, of the lake, the weather was so changed and now cultivation is then a disaster because they can big rains or no rain at all. Um, this project, to me, it seems to be uh, one more thing of the uh, total uh, blindness of human beings to believe in things that they don't understand. Um, Energy flux density, he mentioned. What does he mean by that? Energy flux density. Ooh, energy flux density. Like if that, that means that you know something about something. Uh, he also mentioned hydrogen fuel. Hydrogen, hydrogen. The energy, energy density of hydrogen is so low that if you want to run a car, for 200 miles and you want to pump it with hydrogen, you would have to put a tank that is heavier than the car at tremendous pressure to put enough hydrogen in there to run the car for that amount of time. Uh, then he, he had mentioned about matter and antimatter. What, what do we know about matter and antimatter and how to utilize that? This is science fiction of the, of the lowest quality. Yes. Um, Thanks, uh, uh, then uh, it was mentioned in passing the coronal mass ejection uh, or the consequences of the coronal mass ejection. If you keep talking, God damn it, can you can you can you you know restrain yourself for a minute? We are like children, we couldn't uh, Anyway, uh, the coronal mass ejection was mentioned uh, in passing, and this is a big, big, uh, big thing. We we may be subject to one of those coronal mass ejections, and that put in jeopardy all the nuclear reactors of the type that we have in Fukushima. Uh, if we have a major coronal mass ejection, we can have many meltdowns, not four like they have in there. If you want to know more about that, I can tell you. Then, thorium, thorium. These idiots talking about thorium, they know nothing, absolutely nothing about thorium. And they talk like, like big experts, you know, oh, thorium is the solution. Now, building thousands of nuclear reactors, they know nothing because there is not enough nuclear fuel to fuel thousands of reactors. There is just total lack of knowledge, and a, 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 a criminal lack of knowledge, because it's bullshitting the people into something that is totally unlike. Um, <coughs> if you let these guys loose in the way that they project, they, they, they are going to dominate the earth, you know, but they will destroy the earth in no time. There is no project that they will oh. see unlikely to to be produced and, and not have any consequences. Sorry. So. All right. <laughs> you to job on it. Thank you, Frank. And our guest, uh, I like this guy. He's got a lot, of, a lot on the ball. Um, there wasn't too much mentioned about health for some reason or other. You have to have healthy people, six million people, to start up this project. Is there anyone here in the room that does not understand how toxic refined sugar is? Good. Okay. Because sugar, when it's after it's processed, blocks the absorption of calcium in the body. That's your bones. Okay? So if you're eating a lot of refined sugar, this could be pop, candy bars, puddings, pies, cakes, cookies, white bread, which is a carbohydrate, you're pissing your bones away. 
The calcium comes out of your bones to buffer the sugar and protect your body against this insult of sugar, which is extremely acidic. Okay. Thus, sugar also produces a low oxygen environment in your body. I have an article here from 19, around 1930, right after the crash, where a lot of brilliant Jewish people came out of the woodwork and were given Nobel Prizes and so on for their research in trying to put the world back together after that crash. Otto Warburg was one such man, and he did a lot of work on oxygen, oxygen uptake, pulse oxygen, and so on. It's brilliant work, and it's on the internet. You saw the other day that um, there was a guy down in Florida that took all his clothes off. They said he was on cocaine and started eating the face of a homeless man. The, someone reported it, and um, the cops came over there and shot the guy when he bared his fangs to the policeman and um, insulted the policeman like he was going to eat the policeman, too. Okay? Now... What happened here? Here's a study from the that was presented to the 74th Congress, second session in the Senate, number 264, an article by Rex Reach entitled Modern Miracle Men, relating to proper food mineral balances by Dr. Charles Northern, an MD, reprinted from a magazine in 1936, presented by M. Fletchner, July 1st, calendar 1936, ordered to be printed. Okay? Now, in 1936, there was still a lot of uh, brain cells working. They were coming off the crash. 33 was still pretty bad, too, but in 36, this is printed by the government printing offices, 1936. I want to read you a little bit of this because this is extremely important as to what happened in Florida. My take on this is that the government has been developing what would people refer to as this guy as a zombie, <coughs> eating people. It's not real funny. It's kind of, you know, interesting that this would happen. The government is doing But listen to it. There you go again, Charlie. Uh, lipping off, okay? Wait till I'm done. Or get your oh, fat oh, ass oh. up here. Get your fat ass up oh, here and sit down. And you got something to say, to say it later, later oh, okay? Please, and you, uh, this is yeah, your 20 minutes Sergeant to get Arms. To the point. A 10-year test with rats proved that by withholding calcium, didn't we just talk about calcium coming out of your bones to um, buffer this sugar? They can be bred down to a third the size of those fed with an adequate amount of calcium. Their intelligence, too, can be controlled by mineral feeding as readily as can their size, their bony structure, and their general health. Place a number of these little animals inside a maze after starving them in a certain mineral element. The starved ones will be unable to find their way out in a simple maze, whereas the others will have little or no difficulty in getting out. Their dispositions can be altered by mineral feeding. Okay? Here's the part that I'm interested in, and I'll read a little bit more. They can be made quarrelsome, and belligerent. They can even be turned into, and I'll repeat this, cannibals. Yes, cannibals. And be made to devour each other. Many backward children are called stupid merely because they are deficient in calcium and magnesium. Okay? We punish them for our failure to feed them properly. I was sugar poisoned as a kid. I cried a lot because I had a cast on my foot for a correction of a genetic um, dysfunction in our family, which is pigeon toe. The doctor had to break my foot, straighten it out, and put a cast on it. I cried a lot. Grandma gave me a lot of candy. Get, to shut me up, get me to sleep, because when you put a lot of candy in a child, uh, their insulin uh, levels go up. Am I done? Uh, well, I, okay. Uh, your insulin levels go up, then they drop precipitately, and the child goes to sleep. 
So she was, my sleeping pill was candy. And I got hooked on that jump for 53 years. I've got sisters that are taller than me. So you count them? And um, there's also a book here that I have in the last few seconds. In, and this is a history of health. In 1493, Columbus transports sugar cane to the New World on the advice of Queen Elizabeth. In 1515, this goes back 200 years, Spanish monks offer loans in gold to anyone who would start a sugar mill. In 1560, about 45 years later, Charles V of Spain builds vast palaces using taxes on the sugar trade. And this goes on and on for pages about the sugar trade and how it has poisoned the world. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I read uh, something years ago about uh, LaRouche, the founder of the group and so forth, and his economic writing, his economic writing in, uh, in, in other uh, publications that he had. Uh, the man is heavy. I'm not a follower of LaRouche, but I am a person that is willing to accept even things that I don't like. You cannot say that two and two is five because that makes you comfortable. Now, there's, there's few people in the house here, and I'm going to name four of them, and I'm going to talk about one of them. Now, <laughs> Tim Boyser, my man, uh, Bob Mather, and the guy that run the place, Charles. Now they uh, accept two and two is five. <laughs> but, uh, <in> order, <laughs> no, 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 in order to strengthen their position. Now like, like Frank over here, he gets up and talk about the speaker. The speaker's speech remind me a, a little of his boss. You what, you ain't, <laughs> I ain't gonna say, I read about you and you, he, LaRoche is heavy. Ain't nothing short about him, mentally, intellectually, and so forth and so on. And you are close behind him. Anybody over a certain age, Tim is probably one of the youngest people here. But I can't understand somebody Frank's age going to get up here and say this guy didn't say it, wasn't talking about nothing. He, was, he mentioned the glass steagle at it. I don't have to listen to him to know what he was saying. Why? Because I'm as old as he are. He is. So, consequently, that means that I'm listening to him. That means that as time passes by, instead of me looking at laws and dancing with the stars, I'm looking at something else. That's important. And consequently, when somebody like the speaker here give a speech, <laughs> when he said, uh, Glass steagle, oh, that's big. Now, how anybody in here is so dumb or so young that that's not serious? I mean, they, they should have been quiet when they heard that. Glass steagle is the law that separated the commercial bank from Wall Street. Yeah, that's my, that's right. All the problem, goddammit, we having is because of Wall Street. And you're going to treat and Steagall and Glass like this man talking crazy? Give me a motherfucking break, please. <laughs> he mentioned this physical economy. What's so out about that? I'm old enough to remember when they pumped goddamn uh, uh, oil in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, all over the fucking United States. I'm old enough to remember when they put caps on them. That's the physical United States. I mean, with steel mills all over the South Side. They don't. That's the physical economy he was talking about. And you don't understand what the fuck he's talking about? Give me a motherfucking break, please. <laughs> so, so he talks about a system that needs to be changed, and we want to save ourselves. Okay. Now, how in the hell, a Bob Matter, Jim Bozier, Frank Aguila, and anybody else gonna stand up? and challenge the man on something that even a blind man can see. In fact, I called Stephen Wonder the other day. He said, yeah, I saw it. <laughs>
I was here when uh, we had a different uh, way of doing business. I was here when we had more control over our government. I was a grown man. He, oh, he mentioned the wall situation. Fighting walls in order to sustain the few thieving assholes that have stole all the money. I'm old enough to remember Korea. I'm old enough to remember Vietnam. Technically, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Not that I was across the water, but I got it in 1961. Now, anybody going to sit around and ignore Vietnam? You going to sit around and ignore all the goddamn walls we be in, and you done looked around the goddamn country, in the world, and who else going to war? United States, United States, I don't remember Canada going to no motherfucking war. Britain went down to South America, down there to the Little Island, and Russia, I don't remember when they been in the war, since World War II and so forth. So who's in the fucking war all the time? If I see this as a goddamn intelligent man of sound mind, ain't I'm supposed to ask a question? And I'm supposed to say, well, what's going on here? I'm supposed to say, well, what is this for? And we got trillions of dollars, real dollars. I'm talking about the hundred dollar bill stacked in white warehouses all over the goddamn world. He mentioned that. He said we need a physical econ uh, economy because, and he didn't say that, I'm saying that, you can't hide no motherfucking steel bill. You can't hide no oil well. But you can hide that six trillion dollars that you done nipped out the credit uh, uh, the, 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 the through the, uh, the, the, the bank, okay. the big bank that runs this shit for Wall Street and the Treasury Department that we have. Ten seconds. Uh, what? Yeah, ten seconds left. Oh, okay. And, so, so he done mentioned all of that, and all of that is important. And how in the fuck can you ignore it? The Federal Reserve, that's the play from the. Uh, thank the speaker. Uh, he's obviously well prepared. Uh, he certainly held my interest, and some of the things he said are probably true. Uh, the one thing that I was really interested in was that HR uh, 1489. I'm going to see if I can take a look at that. I hate the internet, but I'm going to take a look at it. All you got to do is go to uh, Thomas. LOC.gov and look up that uh, bill and you can see uh, more about it. I was interested that uh, you know three you uh, three Illinois reps, including Lipinski, were for that. So I'm going to try to take a look at that. I'm going to spend most of my time on the uh, German situation because that really is of interest to me. I read the uh, book. Uh, uh, a Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duval. They cover that in that book. So you can pick up the book. You don't have to read the whole book. It's 50 pages. talks about 1923 and Germany. What happened was Germany wasn't paying its reparations. France invaded. At that time, France had the biggest army in the world, believe it or not. If, at least the book says so. And uh, the Germans had no uh, army. So they used nonviolent resistance. The only problem was the government was really stupid. They agreed to support the strikers and, and protesters, and they instead of uh, taxing the wealthy who had some money, they just printed money. And it's true, well, at least the book says, between January and April, the value of the money got went down so bad that in April it was uh, 57,000, I guess it was marks, to the dollar. In other words, their money was totally useless. Anyway, what wound up happening was that, Ger that the French got nothing out of it. The German middle class was totally wiped out. Just figure you had your money in the bank. What would your money be worth? And America came in, American financiers came in and said, uh, we'll straighten this out, but France, you've got to get out of Germany because uh, nothing will happen until you leave. So the French got nothing out of it. 
They were very frustrated. They had to rebuild themselves, their country themselves. The German middle class was wiped out. And uh, we learned something about inflation. Thank you. My name is Michael Foley. I'm not going to say too much. Uh, one thing, the speaker hasn't been real specific about the problem. He's more or less said that the country is going down the drain. Actually, the United States of America has already gone down the drain. It's just that the American public, the general public, hasn't realized it yet. There's a coming thermonuclear war, and that might happen. I ain't going to say it won't, but who knows, that could happen, maybe, maybe not. And the world, or at least a large part of the world, is run by the British Empire, which essentially morphed from the Roman Empire through the centuries into the British Empire. He could be right about that too, although I think that the American Empire is dominant, or the American British Empire, maybe it's a joint venture. But anyway, I do believe that there is really a very, very small group of people who actually run the whole world or a very large part of it. That's why I mentioned David Rockefeller. The man in the back asked me if I thought David Rockefeller was still alive or dead. That's what we were talking about back there. I actually honestly don't know if David Rockefeller is still alive. I think he is, but he might be dead. If he is alive, I'm sure he's in his 90s. But I think David Rockefeller ran a large part of the world for many years when he was head of the Chase Manhattan Bank. They directed the money and they owned the politicians that were in charge of spending it and who gets it and who don't get it. But anyway, somehow or other, if you move huge amounts of water from Alaska to Colorado, this is going to solve all the problems of the world. And I don't believe it. I'm not going to say anything bad about you, sir, because maybe you really, really believe what you said. Maybe you're well-meaning. But if it was a politician up here saying, you let me this or that or the next thing and we'll put through this water project, going to solve everything, I'd stand up there and call the guy a liar and tell him he's flat out full of shit. Because it's just preposterous. I can't think of any good reason to be moving huge amounts of water from Alaska thousands and thousands of miles to the southwest. There's plenty of food in this world. There ain't no reason to be growing food in the desert to the southwest. I also understand the concept of make no small plans because small plans are nitpicked apart Huge plans, you can overwhelm people, just shove stuff through, and then once the project starts, it just takes on a life of its own. But these grandiose projects that are supposed to solve all the problems of the world are just bogus BS. A couple years ago, we were told, all we got to do is get the Olympics in 2016, and we'll all be singing Happy Days Are Here Again. Somehow, Mayor Davey would have been singing it, Pat Ryan would have been singing it, and the people that would have got the money that came out of our pockets would be singing it. But we would not be singing it, we'd be saying, geez, I'm broke again. As far as the Money First Man's project, he never even gave us the biggest idea of how much money it would cost, where the money would come from. He said a project would last 30 years or more. Somehow, at best, he said it would pay for us. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth either, sir. I'm just saying this is the impression I got from the lecture. At best, it would either pay for itself or else it wouldn't cost anything. It'd be free. Don't worry about the money. It's got something to do with real money, not phony money anyway, blah, 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 blah. But it's going to solve all the problems of the world, everything. That's all. Next. Just trying to get the timer right there. Give me a 30 second break to collect your thoughts. <laughs> I agree with our speaker on one, one major point. 
that we're headed, we need a very large, we need a very large change in America. We're headed towards some kind of apocalyptic junction. Uh, some people are predicting we're going to have a nuclear power, uh, nuclear, nuclear war if we don't change. Here's a book on uh, 212. I've been uh, reading and uh, studying on the, what the ancient Mayans wrote about the date, December 21st this year, where one cycle ends and a new 26,000 year cycle of how the planets and the galaxies move. Uh, the Mayans got the time frame right thousands of years before anybody had telescopes before they could see anything out there. I want to know who helped them. The human race appears to be vastly older than what we've been led to believe. And for the last 150, 200 years, our banking system, our financial industrial complex has been run by some very, very smart, very highly skilled people with really finely developed criminal tendencies. You know, I don't know how many people have said, you know, the definition, the very definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. William James. But William James, maybe. But we, I start with square one facts. Number one, number one, if we're going to get out of uh, the current problem with oil and energy and everything else, is to recognize something that is being recognized around the world but blacked out by the press in the United States. The ratio of sunlight coming in, the sunlight that falls on the planet every day for free from a clean fusion reactor out there 93,000 million miles away, the ratio is 10,000 to 1. Now, the sunlight falling on the earth for an hour would run the human race for a year. Germany has already put up enough solar panels to shut down 20 nuclear power plants because the current prices and the prices are falling like they did with cell phones, DVD players, computers. Cost curve is going like this. Solar power and wind power at today's prices are vastly cheaper than building any kind of new nuclear power plant. For one thing, just the real economics, not to mention the American media blackout of what happened in Japan is allowing Americans, well-meaning people, to give speeches promoting the idea that we can increase our nuclear power 15-fold. There's four or 500 power plants, 430 or something, all over the world. America's got 103. I think the total worldwide nuclear power plants are all of them that were ever built. is something under 500. To create, uh, to increase that to 6,000, with the knowledge of what happened recently in Japan, shows a, a fundamental lack of grasp on the reality of the situation. There isn't a few people in Japan that object to nuclear power. They got high levels of radiation in Tokyo that uh, young women are learning that they can kiss off the idea of having a, a non-deformed baby if they're going to get pregnant. The, our troops are being divided up between uh, Troops, uh, they're, they're doing studies right now showing uh, what the babies look like, how many babies that were born before our troops went to Iraq and Afghanistan, and the babies they're trying to have now with all kinds of deformities after they've been living in a radioactive wasteland of radioactive dust in Afghanistan and Iraq, which those two countries are considered by a lot of radiation experts to be uninhabitable. Uninhabitable for humans for God knows how many years. Jeremy Rifkin wrote a book, I talked about this uh, a few months back, there's a book called The Third Industrial Revolution that talks about what's going on in Europe right now. They're considering like 190 million buildings. Every one of those buildings is a source of uh, energy that can be collected with cheap solar panels, feed it into the grid, mm -hmm. and you have uh, electricity being produced cheaply and safely all over the entire area. The Third Industrial Revolution, you want, to, you want to see a book that holds tremendous hope for the future and fast change. Uh, you can put up solar panels and windmills in one, perhaps uh, one hundredth of the time in months that it takes to build one singular nuclear power plant. And uh, you know, talking about going to nuclear power as an energy source is like talking about switching over to build, burning $50 a quart brandy in your car. 
and expecting it to get us off the oil crisis. Uh -huh. It's fiscal insanity. So how do we have people, otherwise very highly educated, learned, intelligent people, promoting something that is now known to be a disaster worldwide with anybody that's had first-hand experience with a meltdown that spews radioactive garbage out into the area. Japan is a disaster. The Japanese people want to shut down their entire nuclear power industry. As I understand, they voted for a moratorium, and the leaders voted for a moratorium and shut them all down, the operating ones, until uh, they decide what to do. But they're, they're going to energy alternatives as fast as they can in Japan. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche has produced a lot of good. Want to sign right up? Do I have a minute left with this? Oh, okay. I'll say one last thing. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche has produced a lot of good economic analysis over the years, but he loses massive credibility when he promotes the disaster of nuclear power as a viable energy source. That's like saying, uh, you know, basically, we can revamp our school system and all, all we'll have to do is get used to sacrificing one baby on the altar once a day to the gods and it'll change our school system. We, we wouldn't go along with something like that. Those kind of sacrifices went out years ago. And we we're moving forward as supposedly as an intelligent race, not going backward. So there's all, all kinds of beneficial things happening if we truly open our eyes and look around. Thank you.
uh, with uh, the uh, the Marushis. Uh, uh, they they are gathered around the guru, and uh, the guru has has various uh, focuses. So a fusion power was one of them. Uh, uh, but he's been fairly consistent in saying that we would go into a crash in uh, the near future, and he was saying that in, in 71, and he has been saying that ever since. Uh, people looking at uh, the, the uh, bases of uh, the American economy and uh, 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 capitalism uh, generally uh, might uh, give some credence uh, to that. Uh, and, and certainly uh, we should, you know, the, the uh, stopped clock is right twice a day, and uh, you have to uh, know that uh, the uh, economy is in very bad shape, and I, it, it's partly the fault of the market. Uh, not uh, and, and Marx's writings on capital uh, indicated the the, uh, the contradictions of of the capitalist system that could uh, bring about. A, uh, a crisis uh, that would result in uh, a, a, the possibility of a new society. Uh, what kind of society that might be is up to humanity to decide. Okay, well, first of all, let's just get this Marx crap right out of the way. <laughs> Marx was totally, 100% basically wrong about everything. First of all, the mainspring of human motivation is self-interest, not collective interest. And there are millions and millions of dead Chinese and dead Russians to prove that. Whenever they try collectivizing a farm, and so everybody realizes that, well, I don't have to work very hard because the guy next to me is going to work hard, so I'm just going to take it easy. And, it's, and it, it just doesn't work. So he got that totally right off the bat. He's totally wrong right off the bat. And he should have just read Adam Smith and learned <laughs> yeah, something from that. He, did. Uh, he, did. he didn't learn anything from it, I guess. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that he, he ignored, uh, essentially ignored land and talked about capital too much to cap. Capital you can reproduce, you know, but land you can't. You know, land is a monopoly item of location value. So, uh, and uh, so, Adam Smith was really the guy that pretty much mostly got it right. And then uh, Henry George probably tied it and he bundled them. Everything. But anyway, uh, this history of wars. Well, this goes back to uh, you know, man always wants someone else to work for him. He always wants something for nothing, right? The idea is, to get, the idea is to get somebody else to work for you. You know, they say, like, the art of government is getting two-thirds of the people to work for the other third, right? Uh, the, the way man first got other people to work for him was, was by, well, you, well, he was plundered by just stealing his stuff. It's essentially another way of getting stuff that he didn't really work for, and that's that's through war. You just go over there across the mountain or across the river and clobber the other people and you take their their horses and their food and their houses and stuff. Yeah, that's man. one way. So that's the first way man did it. The second way they man did it was through slavery. Yeah. Right? You have people working, you know, and you get the fruits of their labor. And that went on for quite a while. Then the next thing that came through was protectionism which is still with us a little bit today. And also, of course, is, uh, this idea of, of rent, of charging uh, you know, all those who come after you a toll, basically, for living on the earth. 
So you're born into this world instead of sharing in the bounty of the world. You got to pay some sh some schmuck rent because he's got a piece of paper that says that he owns this. You know, this is his, and you have to give it to him. Well, that's bullshit. You know, so first of all, we need to, you know we need to question that stuff. Uh, now, here's a problem with these make work projects like this. These workers, these six million guys are going to start work, they're going to want to get paid. They're going to want some cash so they can go to the supermarket and buy stuff, right? Well, what's going to happen overnight? The first paychecks that they, all these guys get, all six million of them, they're going to get a paycheck one day, and there's going to be all these you know, millions and millions of dollars flooding the market. But guess what? There's not going to be any additional goods in the market. So what happens when you have... Lots of cash and the same amount of goods. Prices go up, right? Inflation. Uh, that's, that is inflation, folks. Uh, too many dollars chasing too few goods. See, the inflation is the difference between production uh, and money supply. Now, you can have countries that have a high growth in money supply but also have a high growth in production as well, and they have very low inflation because inflation is the gap between the two. But when you have your production is, you've got the same amount of TVs on the shelf and cars on the lot and steaks in the supermarket, you have the same amount of those, yes, you know, today as you did yesterday, but meanwhile now you've got six million new people with paychecks. This gap here, this is inflation, folks. So that's not going to work. Someone's going to have to pay for all that, and it's going to be the taxpayers, right? It's going to come out of our hides. Well, you have to look, like as Bastiat said, those of you that read uh, uh, essays on political economy uh, for the last political economy book club selection, will know that Bastiat used to say, the difference between a good economist like myself and bad economists oh. like Charlie or Marx or LaRouche <laughs> is that we know the difference between what is seen and what is not seen. So what is seen is six million people cashing a check and having spending power. What is not seen, though, is the other millions of us, the many more millions are going to have to have that taken out of their taxes, right, to pay for this stuff. And that's the money that we are not going to be able to spend ourselves because it's taken out of our taxes to give to these guys. So all it's doing is just... It's taking away our ability to spend. So it's not nothing's really happening. You're just taking remember the government has two hands. One hand to give and one hand to take. One, one hand's reaching in somebody else's wallet, pulling out their money and giving it away to somebody yeah, else that's with, good. with another that's hand. Guys. Okay. I uh, know too bad Frank left. I, Frank, I wanted to hear why there's more shrinks per capita in Argentina than anywhere else. He said he, he yeah. said there's a story behind that to tell me why. I don't know why, but uh, that's what uh, Bert Wolf said on on, uh, on TV this morning. Any other any economic questions before I sit down? Oh, oh you might want to know why is there why is there like the current oil price thing not causing inflation? That's a common misconception. Somebody's talking about oil. I guess it's Doc Mike, and he's left now. Well, because if you don't have an increase in money supply and you merely have something like oil going up from a price shock or something oil, people are going to, they're just diverting money they would have spent on something else on oil. So there's, so you can have really uh, technically no inflation, although this tends to, this is what kind of causes these you know, there'll be demands. People will start demanding higher wages because they have to pay the, the higher gas. People don't want to give up their Starbucks, you know, and their uh, internet and all that stuff, their iPhones, so they can have more money to buy gas. They 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 want more money. They want to have it all, but can't do it. But as long as uh, as long as the the money supply is not increasing, you can have a, a spike in something like oil and or gasoline and, and not have inflation. It has been alluded to tonight by several people in this audience that we need to get back to a scientific mentality to start making things work for America and our country. 
it has been said too, and that same thought is shared by the New York Times columnist, Thomas L. M. Friedman, on that was us. I do agree that we have to look back into our history to find out where we were at to what we should become again. However, one of the things that is not really known is that the, some of the solutions are already here. Now, we, tonight we've heard a lot about nuclear power and how it's awful, and frankly, the light water reactor in the system we have now is awful. It doesn't work. Only 1% of the uranium is built up. But I was just at a conference earlier this week of the Thorium Alliance, and they're coming here to speak on July 15th, and I learned a few things about the newer generation of reactors, some of the newer things they're doing it, and some of the private initiatives coming online to do just this. And frankly, I was shocked, or I should say surprised, that the amount of practical sub-applications of this stuff that will be coming down the line to produce base load good power. And at the same time, I'm also in agreement with our gentleman over here about the use of renewables, wind and solar. The question is, it's going to need to be all of the above to get our solutions forward because in any endeavor that mankind has, the production of power and necessary energy to maintain an infrastructure and maintain a way of life is definitely needed. Now, if we can get that through solar and wind power, that's great. There, in fact, there's a guy on a, on a, on a website called TED.com who promotes that with just the replacement of our existing infrastructure, the use of the smart grid, and many other of the emerging technologies, says we will be off oil in less than 50 years with the complete phase out of nuclear power. There's others, like at this conference, that have been saying, look, when the rest of this world develops, we need to provide a viable alternative for cheap power. And frankly, if I'm not going to get into the technical differences between the use of thorium and the U-233 cycle and the other items involved in it, but it's certainly a lot safer than the present generation of reactors. As a matter of fact, the gentleman by the name of Albert Weinberg, who invented the light water reactor, came in the late 70s to condemn its very use, saying that nuclear power was a Faustian bargain. But he did go on to test at Oak Ridge National Laboratories new types and new things that are much safer, much there. There's still the risk of radiation. There's still a lot of the risk of proliferation. I'm not going to say that there's none. But for, for a good base load power, there is certainly the advantages to that. I won't get into it here because we'll be getting into that the 15th of, of, of July. I will say this, though. When you look at the power of capitalism to change things, all I'm going to point to is what's happened in the last 20 years, and that's called the development of the Internet. America can't make things anymore. Take a look at that camera back there for the use of, uh, you know, the use of worldwide integrated technology and globalization produced just that at a much cheaper price and much more variable now than there ever was. And you, you're wondering where the high-paying high, high paying jobs are coming from right now? There's a real shortage of computer people with technology and programming skills that are going to definitely be needed in the next 30 to 40 years. There's a lot that's going to be happening in the world in the next 30 years, but I don't think it's going to be war. I do know there's tensions involved and that our system can collapse at any minute given the right set of circumstances, but I don't think we're going to be ready. I think the next century is going to be one where the United States is, is going to be somewhat more dominant than we are now. We're just the beginning of our power. If you wonder why, just ask a gentleman by the name of, uh, who runs a, he wrote, wrote a book, it was called the, 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 A Forecast for the Next Hundred Years. And what he basically says is the first trend is going to be the aging of the population around the world. And what that simply means to me, if you look at demographics, men in their 30s and 40s and 50s tend to be a lot more peaceful than those in their 20s. Now, the problem that we're having with that is what's going to happen with all the aging people that are going to be increasing medical care, increasing uh, you know, government subsidies, and <coughs> lifestyle, and other things. 
What it simply says, folks, is we're going to need to open our borders for new, younger immigrants coming in for jobs. Today we have the free movement of capital anywhere in the world. Why not open the same movement of people around the world? And guess what will happen? We will see a lot of things go right. Let me tell you about something about what globalization actually does. Mongolia is a desert country and their population for years has never had a chance to really succeed. But just recently they found new copper, oil, and gold deposits that are literally making the country boom, and China is now relying on them more than other areas for, for uh, you know, minerals and other items. Take a look at some of the other things, but again, it's time for me to go. There are solutions out there. There are ways to make things work. I don't agree with all the his solutions to it, but they're out there. One thing in particular, look at the opening of the Highway 1 road between North and South America, which is less than 50 miles, needs to be complete. You guys are uh, putting me to sleep here. Oh, yeah, Charlie. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker, really. He's been in a lot of preparation, brought a lot of books up. He's going to get some publications there and try to lead. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. I'm pleased to find out that the capitalist fascists are going into Mongolia to for extraction of minerals and I'm sure they're going to leave with a wonderful moonscape place <laughs> when they get done with it as they've done so well in the past in mining operations wherever they've shown up. Without mining, to make it look like the moon. Mongolia isn't much to begin with but after these guys, these bastards get done with it it really is going to be out, out of Mongolia, that's for sure. And you don't understand Marx at all. Marx was talking about the fundamental relationships and the sharing of material goods. And certainly in agricultural communities, they know the value of cooperation. You go out there, you mm -hmm. see co-ops. I was thinking today, there's covered operas on trains for grain by cooperatives, farmers' cooperatives. We found that obviously it was better to work with, work with each other than on isolated pieces of property by yourself. You certainly can ex increase the production and distribution of food. Which, um, I mean, if Marx was basically looking, do you want to have a relationship that's cooperative? Everyone cooperating and sharing? Or do you want everyone fighting with each other? And seeing who there's going to be one winner and everyone else loses under his system. Which do you want? So this is yours, one winner, 500 losers. That's what you get. One winner, that's it. Yeah, that's but baloney. And it's a factory owner that doesn't share anything with you. He doesn't care, he doesn't care if, you, if he shuts the damn place down and disappears. He don't care what happens to you. You know, that kind of system is that. Anyhow, the West is desperate for water. I didn't realize that the first time I was in. Boise, Idaho, they get to water their lawns like once a week, a little bit, you, and if you miss that, that's it, man. I said, why? Wow, I've never experienced that before. Uh, those are inhospitable wilderness areas. Um, there's no way, like, to get even Idaho I mentioned, there's no way to get from the north to the south except by plane. There's, you don't know the terrain you're talking about. To go in there is just, just incredible. I mean, I ventured in there, I didn't... I didn't like it too much because there's no way to, you're really on your own up there. And that's going a long way in the British Columbia up to Alaska there. That's terribly, that's the most inhospitable to turn. There's no water also, they're desperate. That's why I only in my town it takes like 50 acres for one cow, there's not even grass. Um, let's see, uh, let's see, what else am I, oh the transcons. I was going to talk about this, the, the Rockies, we had somebody spoke on this project a number of years ago. It wasn't their principal thing, these guys that had the U.S. Labor Party mentioned this project a little bit, that wasn't their principal thing. Um, yeah, no they're not, they were different, they were starting their own Labor Party. U.S. Labor Party. Yeah, they're not, they were not Lyndon LaRouche. No, they were not. Yes. Yeah, he ran in... Um, was he? In 78, 76. Oh. 
he formed a uh, productive party of labor okay. and agriculture. All right, so the same thing. Um, let's see. I um, um, does yeah. I I I think you've got to be a little cautious too about some. You know. Um, the glass seagull too is a, you didn't cover that as much as I thought you would. That's the reversion to the banking laws of the 30s, and they're using the new name now, uh, the new legislation that's been introduced. I don't follow this that closely. It is given some interest whether or not I don't know the distinction between investment bankings and things of that nature. But Congress is seriously looking towards imposing those regulations. I think they're probably headed in the right direction here. Um, whether or not sugar turns us all into zombies and we're all going to start eating one another, I, I, I'm going to be cautious about having it in the future here. Um, ah, the thing about this project is it's probably easier to finance if we simply took the money that we're spending on the military industrial complex. Uh, probably we could have about three or four of these projects here, you know. Whether or not they, we should do something like this, I mean, there's environmental concerns. There's also some things about undertaking in alternative things. You talk about transportation network, he's talking about solar. Uh, you know, these are value engineering type situations here. You know, I've got 45 seconds to say, uh, I don't know, I think we'd have to look at it. You know, they are desperate for water in these, in these increasingly populated areas here. It probably shouldn't be. Uh, whether or not these are feasible projects, uh, you know, that, that's up to the people doing the studies and things of this nature. I personally don't think we should be rearranging the earth on this magnitude. Uh, in order to accommodate people who want to live in California. How about Idaho? How about Idaho? How about Idaho? I'm serious, yeah, yeah, these yeah. are really dry spots. I'm sorry that's the way they are. Yeah. Um, also, I was going to talk about the Transcontinental Railroad. It was a totally different kind of project altogether. And I don't think it quite fits, it's not identical to this whatsoever here. Uh, to make work projects, those were also to cure existing problems of flooding that went on. TVA was to, because of the, the floods that took place, and they were trying to curb that more so than this makes life better or something like this. Those are serious floods they were having there. I think that's what even brought a lot of the people, black people, to move up north because they, they weren't taken care of in those flooding situations. You know, they were left to just die and things like that. Anyhow, thank you very much. Would anybody blame this on the market? Well, maybe you guys are a little smarter than I give you credit for. Because usually you're blaming everything that goes wrong on the market. Yeah. But the, the market cannot sustain a project like this. And nobody said, no, it can't. Uh, I think, water. I, I think the concept that needs to be introduced, has anybody here heard of pyramid building? You look in Aristotle's politics, about four fifths of the way back, there's a Paragraph which says it befits a tyrant to impoverish his people because they'll have uh, they don't have the resources or the time to resist. And that's kind of what the Keynesian philosophy was about. Was a form. Keynes actually said that wars, earthquakes, and pyramid building served to increase wealth. And we've had that going on almost since the 30s, maybe before. I saw one, well anyway, what we got tonight was, I think, some vintage LaRouche. Uh, all these kind of boondoggle projects. 
the Bering Strait Railroad, and not just the Bering Strait Railroad, but went through Africa, Europe to Africa, and so on. All these things would never be economically justified. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't think it could be done. Just, it's, it's just pyramid building. But anyway, I think we're very, you know, the economy is in very bad shape. But a lot of proposals to straighten out the economy, I think, just make the problem worse. I and mean, I don't think we'll straighten out the economy until you guys finally get an idea of what the market is. We need a free market. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Speaker gets the last word. I would say uh, up to ten minutes, uh, at least. All right. The reinstatement of Glass Steagall separating the real from the bogus is going to end all our problems with the market. They're going to get the handle and deal with their own bad paper, and they can do whatever they want with it because it's already worthless. So the United States was not built on the market. It uh, started with slavery and drug running. It's still doing a lot of that. Everything on the market is basically a manipulation for dupes. You have Sounds various good. kinds of comments on um, economy coming from Keynes to Marx to Adam Smith. And you got all different versions of the empire running monetary theory and has nothing to do with the American system. The American system is based on directed credit establishing a constitution of the United States and a population that provided for its own development the general welfare. It's in the preamble. Most people, including a lot of people in the room today, have not a clue while you're here. And if we don't get beyond clueless, we're not going to be here. We have all kinds of ways of being manipulated. We have a British-run media that made a whole theory. We had people scared to death of radiation coming over from Japan when there was virtually no problem with the nuclear power plants, even some of the older ones. The, the newer ones had no problem at all, some of the older ones. The problem in Japan was the flooding. This is now, we do have the capability of measuring, if we had a, a NASA program, to get the reflections of radon gases as they change in the Earth and the differences in the atmospheres, get a, a global system, coordinated system of nations measuring this, you can actually pick up the cross feeds of these indicators and limit, as they're already doing, like Biagi of Italy and uh, some of these others, you can actually locate, like they did in after, uh, you know, after uh, site, the Haitian earthquake and whatever, and the Japanese one, you had like a 20 and more day advance notice of where the epicenter center was going to be within a 100 mile radius. So they could have shut down all the plants. The problem is there was no government structure that took that advice and actually used it. And we have the same problem here. So the problem in Japan was not a nuclear problem, it was a tsunami problem. And all the whip ups and everything about the Japanese government, everything now wanting to shut down, that's all true. Except the population that was reading the Japanese press and the population that was reading the English press in Jap Japan had two totally different reactions. And a lot of those politicians, like the Prime Minister who shut down the nuclear program, he's also being moved out. You have a similar kind of lunacy that took place in Germany where they're closing down the nuclear power. And they want to go to these low energy flux density approaches which actually cannot sustain the kind of energy density we need. Mm -hmm. So if we want to talk about the sun, let's build little nuclear fusion plants. Let's actually do it. Let's actually get to matter antimatter. And all these questions that came up that are odd kind of thoughts because we don't think about them. Well, we've got a real Luddite problem in the United States. 
And we had a real problem in the schools that teach textbooks as opposed to fundamental breakthroughs. And what I laid out here tonight and what Linda LaRouche has been laying out, is you've got six million jobs that can be put on the line. The question is, do we want them or not? Do we want a financial system that credits tr billions and trillions into that kind of production and creates a future? Or are we too dumb to live? Now, the thing that happened here tonight is although this is laid out, and we can actually go somewhere, and we can have some fundamental questions about how do we figure this out and make it, make it work or not make it work. We didn't get to that. Everybody fell back to their same shtick. <laughs> as if they're standing on the Titanic and say, I'm talking about this. And the very place we started in the beginning, that the whole thing is in a financial blowout, in a hyperinflationary blowout like Germany in 1923, and you either put that mountain of paper through a bankruptcy reorganization so you're not connected to it, and you build something independently that's real and physical, or you're going under. And all that went out the window. Because we can't sustain a fight in our own mind to stay conscious. And we got a culture that reinforces that. We walk out the door, we'll go along with the same cuts. We'll go along with the same people who are mouthed as experts. We'll go along with the same kind of choice for the election between... Two set-up cases, one of them an actual real nutcase, was actually groomed specifically to do the preemptive strike. Romney ain't that bad, is he? Huh? I said, <laughs> Romney ain't that bad, is he? <laughs> what? He ain't what a is nutcase, the, is he? Oh, Why are you calling him a nutcase? What is the policy of Romney to do anything? He just said he's a nutcase and he's going to do the preemptive Anybody strike. Anybody who is not pushing... Glass-Steagall right now to put the system through a bankruptcy and build something real is nuts. I have one quick question that nobody asked. Uh, what the, the whole, as I have heard it, uh, it's the whole planetary output of $65 trillion a year or something, global trade, or, you know, some number like that, but the derivatives, the debt they rang up, or they say, well, the, the, we have $900 trillion in debt. Why don't the people, I mean, how, I don't understand why they can just say, well, all these people, we owe this, all this debt. Why not just say, we don't owe you that anymore? Why not just cowardice. write it off? Cowardice. Cowardice. The problem is, since the killing of Kennedy, we haven't produced anything. It's been a bit of route politically. Look at both sides. <laughs> and the, the, the problem, I mean, you take the only guy who actually drawn that line for the last 40 years is Lyndon LaRouche. And all they had to do was isolate him and say this and this and this. Not that everybody thought that what they were saying was true, but people, the problem is we have very few people who actually think for themselves, that actually can handle being a mind. You know, we fill our lives with all kinds of things so we don't have to think about that. And we're at a point where we now have to think about that. Now, whoever starts thinking about that is not going to be the majority. But we don't have to be the majority. We have to be a catalytic force that actually allows people to build out of this. Now, the two journals I have here, and people should, we're down to a small group. Are they for sale? I like, there's a, we asked 100 bucks for it, people giving them half price, whatever. There's also one on planetary defense. What it does is it walks people through all the details on the plant, a lot of the top experts and whatever, the, the bridges, the tunnels, everything. The most important aspect of this is the third section that goes through public credit. What was the first national bank of the United States? What allowed us to actually become independent of the British control through the central bank operations. That's crucial. The other one is a scientific program on this whole question of planetary defense. It goes through uh, a lot of more technical things, uh, but especially on this, um, this whole question of science and energy flux density. Uh, because we have to be capable in terms of our use of power pretty much immediately to begin handling some of these, these broader functions. I mean, we've been missed a number of times by these, uh, these asteroids and things. And um, 
Problem is right now we can't even, if we pick one up out there way, say like the orbit of Mars, we can't even get there for three-fourths of a year. At least with thermonuclear fusion propulsion, you could get there in a week. You know, with antimatter, antimatter, you could actually get even out of the galaxy, out of the solar system. So the question is, how do you get a system? This is what the Russians are offering us. Let's have a joint collaboration where we get a scientific program again, but get a situation where you could have the creation of a force field or whatever to knock these things off track. Can we develop a system if we know these registers on earthquakes, where before it builds to a 9 or 10 or an 8 level, can you actually do something since it's like a battery charging, you know, can you have the thing set itself off earlier? Can you harness some of these kinds of powers? When you start looking at thermonuclear power, you're looking at, you know, look at the multiplied Nagasaki bomb and, the bomb in Hiroshima. Look at the Japanese earthquake. Look at the power of that compared to what we can produce now in nuclear. Minuscule. All right. In light of the Japanese reactor poisoning no work, you want to build more of these? Well, there's I've nothing... got 10 emails this week about bony fish and all this. Well, a lot of these things where fish are dying is you have patterns are thrown off in terms of their, uh, their picking up of, of magnetic fields and, and whatever. Like these, they get themselves caught in coves and they run out of oxygen and things like this. They're not phenomena that aren't understood. A lot of these animals pick up these things. Well, that reactor I'm talking about, it's leaking. Well, you have some of the older reactors because of the flooding had those problems. Two things could have been done. There were reports earlier they could have shut them down so they were actually not in operation when they got hit. Two, um, they didn't expect that size of a flood. Um, the newer ones actually had no problem, the, the more modern generations. You get into some of these pebble bed operations and things. So the question is we can't allow ourselves to get panicked on things that, we, that are not real. That's the same thing with this kind of, of project. It's, it's, it speaks much more to the human mind and what we have to do and how we have to think again. The biggest thing is we are problem solvers. And we've been a nation of running away from every problem, that especially the political problems. Isn't that a function of the media, maintaining people in a bowl of ignorance? Yeah, but who runs the media? Yeah. Same, same empire. Yeah, the empire runs. It. Yeah, these problems don't allow or admit of solutions. React, reactive stuff is dead. What's that? It does. Why don't you get irradiated? <laughs> but they're. You're talking about. Uh, There's no death from the much an Japanese. My uncle was handling stuff works down there, and they didn't even know it was react radioactive. Well, there's mistakes being made, but there, there was no nobody died from in Japan because of the radiation. People got burned a little bit, but there's no. Um, oh, they had to evacuate the whole town because of the flood and things like that. There was a concern. Yeah, they did that. And so Not the that close to the issue, but it's, I got ten emails this week about this reality. I don't care. I would say who we sent the email. All right. right. People are in Fukushima. The question is who sent the email. Anyway, what do we have? Just Let it wrap up. we got about two minutes. Okay. All right. What I'd like to ask people to do is get a copy of this journal. We need it forced on every congressman. I've got a list of the people who are endorsers. I have a list of people who are supported in other matters. Like I said, we're going to the, the banking layers. We're going to the construction layers. Um, we have to have a nation that immediately begins to think in real terms. This hyperinflationary blowout is now. The war danger directly related to that is right now. We've got a Army um, Joint Chiefs of Staff with Dempsey and others. They're working overtime keeping this nation out of a thermonuclear uh, lunacy by the certain Factions. There's a group of people that wants to have a nuclear war for the economic benefits. Is that what no, you're no, telling no. us? No, no, no. They don't think that way. What they're doing is they're moving at various levels to force a back down of nation states like Russia and China and others. If you're going, to, if you're going through this kind of collapse of the West, this empire cannot allow nation states like Russia and China to continue to be developing. 
they're attempting to force a back down. Obviously, with now Putin in there, there is no back down. So at this level, we're on a confrontation course. Yeah. How do you change that? Is you change the policy of the United States, which is provoking that. You think Russia doesn't have scientists that know that nuclear war would be a mess for everybody? They sure they do. That's why they're doing everything possible to stop it. But they're not going to sit here and say, we'll back down and you can put your missiles there in Poland, which within the second stage is going to give them the capability of knocking out Russia's deterrence. Ron's point would be there's another group of scientists that are being manipulated. Yeah. So there's first strike material being put into Poland again? And Not first strike. They're actually setting up a, a system under the guise that we've got to protect ourselves from Iran, which there, there is no weapons program at this point, and there are no missiles to deliver it. So the Russians aren't stupid. What's this thing about? Well, it's in a position with the radar system out of Romania and other places to pick up any kind of Russia launch. So if there would be a confrontation... Shortly, the Russians know there would be a capability of taking out their second strike, their deterrent strike. So right with Putin and all the military is saying, you put this thing in without any kind of written criteria of what it's for, if you can't be honest enough to lay that out, then you put it in and we're taking it out. Now, that itself takes it to a thermonuclear conversation. But see, it's one of these situations where you've got to take a stance because if you capitulate, you're already dead. It's like the Cuban Missile Crisis here where they had this British agent Khrushchev running this operation, another Cold War operation. And we made at least negotiations, we got the thing settled out, and then we moved with a broader kind of program for development outside that kind of confrontation. Okay. Is your group aware All right. of uh, a scientific progress in the last, say, 30 years okay. to clean the atmosphere after any kind of a nuclear change so that it's not lethal for everybody? I mean, I thought that I thought this idea that you could have a, a thermonuclear exchange was rendered economically and yeah, insane, like there's, there's actually some evidence that the Van Allen belt would do that. I do have to interrupt this After 80% of the human race died. <laughs> okay. it's, it's we a, have to uh, shut down. Any, anybody who is thinking that the level of a thermonuclear exchange is nuts. They should be out you want to head out there? <laughs> okay. I mean, it just... Well, that, I thought that was some right. 20 years ago. No, they, they have all kinds of theories. Nobody knows what the effect would be on the... Uh, atmosphere on, on everything, right, in All terms right. of Thank knocking you. out yeah. agriculture. Let's shut down. Thank you very much, good sir, for your Thank presentation. Yeah. All right. Let's get this oh, positive.